I'm David Spears. Welcome to Insiders. After more than four years of often harrowing evidence, the Disability Royal Commission has now presented a blueprint for badly needed reform. It's laid out the extent of abuse, violence, neglect and exploitation facing people with a disability and wants their rights enshrined in a new law. This landmark inquiry calls for full inclusion in mainstream society, but how to achieve that is less clear. The six commissioners were divided over whether to end segregation completely. It's now up to governments to decide whether to phase out special schools, group homes and disability enterprises. Now, some in the sector are disappointed by the disagreement. They fear it will let federal and state governments off the hook. In a moment, I'll be joined by the Greens Disability Rights Spokesperson, Jordan Steele-John, and later the panel. But first, I spoke with the ABC's Disability Affairs reporter, Naz Campanella, about the Royal Commission's key recommendations. Uh, Naz, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Firstly, what is the most important thing or things the Commissioners have agreed on in this final report? Look, it's important to point out they've agreed on most things in this very lengthy report. We're talking 5,000 pages, 222 recommendations. Some of the really key things that stick out for me are around legislation, uh, recommendations around legislation to really enshrine the basic human rights of people with disability. So we're talking here about the, a proposal to introduce a Disability Rights Act, uh, strengthening of the Disability Discrimination Act, and that would include things like, you know, vilification and, and humiliation of people with disability. Um, also things like, uh, you know, a recommendation around a complaints mechanism so people can air their complaints and have recourse um, around that. Then uh, proposals or recommendations around wanting a, a federal portfolio for disability inclusion with a dedicated minister. And then sort of to bring all of that together, there is a recommendation for a disability uh, commission, and that would be an independent oversight body to, I guess, in a sense, bring all of these bits of legislation together should they get up mm. and make sure that they are working as recommended. Yeah, and have an ongoing uh, point at which uh, some of these complaints can be taken to. On the, on the areas of disagreement, uh, these issues of segregation, special schools, group homes, explain to us why there is disagreement here or why you think there might be disagreement uh, here um, and, and, and how disappointing that might be for the sector. There were some points of disagreement and they were particularly around segregation in group homes, employment and education. So let me step you through that. Firstly, if we take group homes, there was a recommendation from some commissioners to end group homes in 15 years. Now, for a bit of context, about 17,000 people with disability live in group homes across Australia. Most of those people are people with intellectual disability. Then if we move to employment, some commissioners wanted uh, these segregated work settings or they're, they're kind of... The old term was sheltered workshops. They're now Australian Disability Enterprises. Subcommissioners wanted those phased out by 2034. Now, for a bit of an understanding of people who don't understand what segregated employment is, uh, it's really these workshops where people work in industries like uh, packing, cleaning, they're paid just over $2 an hour. We're talking about 20,000 people with disability across Australia. Again, most with intellectual disability working in these. There's about 600 of these type uh, employment uh, settings across Australia. Then probably the one that has garnered the most talk over the last couple of days is really the segregated mm. education. Now, it is important to point out that all commissioners agree that the status quo cannot continue, but it was a three to three split. Now, three want segregated education or special schools phased out by 2051, and they had milestones, sort of timelines to reach that point. Arguably, the other three wanted a softer approach. For them, it wasn't about setting targets or deadlines. They say we're practical. Uh, special schools should move into the mainstream or near mainstream schools and there be better relationships between the two systems. Now, I've spoken to a few advocacy groups in the last couple of days, obviously, very closely. They say these splits are not ideal, but they weren't entirely surprised by them because... You know, they've obviously been listening and watching 
this inquiry closely and obviously taking note of some of the questioning and, and I guess, the vibe in the, mm. in the room, if, in a sense. Yeah, and look, finally, when it comes to what this means for government, particularly the federal government, uh, it's going to take its time because there's a lot of recommendations and work to get through here. Um, but we know the government is also trying to rein in the growth costs of the NDIS. Will this have implications for that effort? Look, this uh, Royal Commission, which went for four years, had a huge scope. It was not specifically around the mm. National Disability Insurance Scheme. I think that's really important for people to understand. Um, the report does state that while an NDIS review is underway, and it's important to know that the review is going to hand down its findings at the end of this month, but the, the report from the Royal Commission says that while the review is underway, it really does want uh, to allow that to run its course and not make any specific recommendations. But look, I really do think there will be some overlap between what we've read in this report from the Royal Commission and what will be handed down in the review from the NDIS. You know, some of the key areas around housing and education will overlap and there'll be a lot of talk around what the states and territories need to do uh, with or separate to the NDIS. Naz Campanella, uh, great to talk to you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Let's bring in now the Greens spokesperson for disability rights and services, Senator Jordan Steele. John, joining us very early in the morning in Perth. Thank you so much for getting up for us, Senator. Uh, look, let's start with the, um, the first recommendation of the inquiry, mm. and it was an area of absolute agreement. That's the call for a, a Disability Rights Act. We already have a Disability Discrimination Act, um, which makes it unlawful to discriminate on the grounds of someone's disability. What difference would a Disability Rights Act uh, make? Well, good morning, David, and great to be with you. I think what the disability community need to see from a Disability uh, Rights Act is a comprehensive piece of legislation uh, aimed at upholding our rights as articulated under the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People in every setting and context in which we exist. It needs to be comprehensive, covering public and private services, um, and it needs to form the basis then for a disability commission uh, which will enable us to uh, take complaints um, around ableism, around segregation, around abuse to that commission and have those complaints investigated and consequences uh, enforced. Over the last four or five years, disabled people have continued to experience violence and abuse and we have at least had the recourse of taking those experiences to a national royal commission. That national mechanism uh, for complaints um, and for redress needs to continue enabled mm. by this act. And this, this act, this Rights Act, uh, mm. would, would mean a, uh, well, a, a employers, schools and others have to be proactively yes. preventing discrimination. What might that look like in practice, do you think? Well, yes, it, indeed. It calls for a proactive obligation to prevent violence, abuse, exploitation and neglect. And that can look like everything from uh, making sure that there is a high level of knowledge in your workforce around uh, disability access and inclusion through to accessible complaint mechanisms if those expectations aren't meant, uh, met. It can look like a positive obligation on government uh, policy makers around uh, whether it be the NDIS or indeed the health-based services or employment or education to be ensuring that the way that those policies are implemented uphold the rights of disabled people and are accessible to us. So it can be a tool uh, for the transformation, the radical transformation that is needed to end ableism and segregation uh, in Australian society. There was less agreement as we were just discussing around the areas of segregation uh, in the school setting uh, when yes. it comes to group homes and employment. Let's start with schools here. Mm. Three of the Royal Commissioners want an end to special schools over a time frame of some 30 years. Uh, the other three don't see a need to phase them out completely. What's your view? Mm. Well. Myself and the, and the Greens really clearly understand and have listened deeply to the, the disability community through the course of this investigation. And what is really clear um, is that in Australia we have a cycle of segregation. A disabled child will start uh, education in a segregated school and then move through to a segregated workplace where they are paid sometimes $2 an hour um, and will be forced to be housed in an institution 
institutional group home setting where they are again segregated. The result of that cycle of segregation is abuse, it is neglect, um, and it is early death. Um, and we must end that cycle. We must break that cycle uh, by transitioning away from those segregated uh, settings and ending them. Now, we need that, that kind of transition to be done in a way that is uh, co-designed with disabled people, with families, with academic experts and unions and uh, all of those that have a, a, a role to play in this transition. But it must be done. Segregation must be ended and it must be ended along an, a rather kind of accelerated timeline ahead of what the Royal Commission what, uh, has suggested. What sort of time frame, just sticking with schools firstly, we'll get to mm -hmm. those other areas, what sort of time frame, I mean the, the commissioners who are in favour of phasing them out say over 30 years, what are you suggesting? Well, 30 years is wildly inadequate, David. To put that in perspective, that would mean that a disabled child born today would be likely to see their child educated in a separated, segregated setting, and that is lonely, that is abusive, that is unacceptable. And so what the Greens have been advocating for in uh, collaboration with the disability sector has been a managed transition that completes by 2030. By 2030? That's perfectly, yeah, that's perfectly possible, um, David. If we work together to transform the classroom, to acknowledge that the education system uh, in the mainstream often doesn't meet the needs of disabled people, but we can make it so. We can do this together by providing additional funding, teacher resources, and making sure that families and administrators are brought along uh, in this transition. Well, you're talking there in about six or seven years, shutting mm. down uh, special schools. Even some in the sector, though, worry that mainstream schools aren't uh, equipped. They may not have, you know, the, the hydrotherapy pool, the, the funding, the, the special teachers and carers that would be required. Is that too fast? Would it leave some kids with complex needs in danger? The, the recommendations of the report, David, whether it be in segregated education or in so many other areas, they will require work and engagement and collaboration. And I truly believe that with the disability community uh, fully dedicated as we are um, mm. to this transition, uh, with the proper engagement from government, and we do need to see the establishment of a federal disability minister to lead that cross-government mm. work. A task force just will not uh, cut it in this space, David. We can achieve those goals, and we must. It is not acceptable for another generation of children to be educated in segregated settings, pay $2 an hour and forced to live in group settings where they are abused. Well, what about group homes? Four of the commissioners said phase them out within 15 years. How fast do you think they should go? Well, again, I think it is very possible to achieve that transition uh, by 2030. What we need to see uh, is engagement from state and federal governments in building diverse housing options for disabled people, recognising as well that disabled people are often trapped in cycles of poverty, mm. financial poverty, uh, because of a DSP that is too low, because of rents that are far too high, uh, forcing us into these settings, um, and housing that is just not physically accessible for people. So if we address these things with urgency, we can pull that off and we must. There really needs to be an acknowledgement that the only appropriate response to this report is action. There can be no more dither or delay or uh, let's set up a task force that's interdepartmental and wait and see. We've got to act on this quickly, guided by disabled voices and the recommendations of disabled uh, commissioners. You, you mentioned the DSP, the Disability Support Pension mm. there. Um, let me just get your thoughts on the workplace issues here because the commissioners yes. are recommending uh, moving people who are working in those disability enterprises, mm -hmm. which currently earn, I think it's at $2.90 an hour, yes. moving them up to the minimum wage, having the government subsidise the employer. What would happen though? Would they still get the disability support pension or would that have to be lowered if they're earning more? How would that work? Well, so you're quite right to point out the reality for 20,000 uh, 
disabled people in Australia is that they are paid between $2.90, but sometimes lower than that, an hour for their work, often denied superannuation, basic employment protections, and that is unacceptable. There must be a, a reality in Australia where disabled people are paid a fair pay for a fair day's work, just as every other Australian is uh, guaranteed under the law. There shouldn't be a caveat on the minimum wage that says, except for disabled people. In terms of how we achieve that, it is perfectly possible to do. In relation to the disability support pension, all that would be required is a modification of some of the eligibility criteria around income, but mm. also what is needed is proactive measures uh, to remove the discrimination that disabled people experience in the workplace um, and an acknowledgement that NDIS-based supports and other supports can play a critical role in supporting disabled people uh, to work and be uh, active in the workplace. Just on Funding. Uh, we know the yes. government is separately looking at, uh, or concurrently looking at, trying to rein in the growth of the, of the NDIS, bring that down to a target rate of 8% growth. Um, where do you stand on the idea of an NDIS levy that's been raised from time to time, or some sort of levy to pay for perhaps not just the NDIS, but some of the other issues you're talking about this morning too? Well, I think when I look at the NDIS, the first thing that springs very clearly to mind is the reality that disabled people have contributed a hell of a lot to uh, the reviews uh, and uh, the kind of um, overviews of the NDIS in the last couple of years. We would do want to see uh, changes so that it is uh, more in line with the supports that people need. But that actually looks like making it easier to access the NDIS, not harder. We need to end this uh, campaign that's seems to be going on within government to kick people with psychosocial disability off the scheme. Um, and we need to recognise that when it comes to funding the NDIS, the federal and state governments have all the tools that they need. If more resources are required, then let us look again um, at things like the state three tax cuts, $313 billion so, okay, but not over, a, not a levy. over not 10 a levy. years. You're not, you're not supporting a levy? Well, I don't see the need for it, David. When there's $313 right. billion, we shouldn't be spending on tax cuts for very rich people or AUKUS submarines that will be $368 billion for something not delivered um, until I'm 60. So there are a bunch of different options on the table for additional resources um, and we should look at those if they are required. And when you say when you turn 60, I should point out you're still a very young man, Senator Jordan. Yes. Senator John, on that note, thanks so much for, uh, for joining us this morning. Thank you so much, David. All right, well, coming up, we're going to turn to the uh, Indigenous Voice campaign. Two weeks until the referendum. Is there any sign of a momentum shift? First, we're going to continue this conversation on the Royal Commission outcome with our panel. Let's bring them in. We're joined this week by Phil Curry, Patricia Carvelis and John Paul Janke. Very good morning to uh, all Hi. of you. Good morning. Uh, look, Phil, first to you. Look, uh, we won't go through all of the 200-plus sure. recommendations <laughs> here, but looking at the main ones, what's going to be easy, what's going to be challenging, do you think, for the government? <clears throat> I don't think any of it's going to be easy. I mean, no. it's all well-meaning. Uh, I think the Act, you know, the, the, um, <coughs> the Discrimination Act, that... that mm. The Rights Act, yeah. The Rights Act, so that sounds reasonably simple. We do it with sort of racial discrimination and sexual discrimination now, so that shouldn't be insurmountable. But, the, yeah, <coughs> the issue with the schools, I think, you know, it, 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 it sounds like a great idea, but logistically the cost of it, you know, the, the expertise, the facilities that would be needed. The Senator Still John's saying doing it by 2030 would be a huge turnaround to do it yeah. by then. So it's, yeah, it, I mean, it's all very well-meaning, but it, it's, it's very ambitious. And, and PK, a lot of this is up to the states to make a call on uh, too, right? And, um, you know, we know with the NDIS, uh, they're already struggling to, to fund the extra uh, non-NDIS services it's that the feds want them to fund. One of the biggest problems at the moment identified by the NDIS Minister, Bill Shorten, is actually in relation to state schools. Mm. He's raised it with me in interviews a couple of times where... Uh, young people, uh, you know, there is a push from state governments for the NDIS to pay for things when Bill Shorten believes that the state governments should be supporting students to learn in these mainstream schools. So I think this idea around um, phasing out specialist education for people with disabilities, young people, is actually... Like, it's, it speaks volumes to me that the people with lived experience want them to be phased out. Uh, and, and honestly, that Jordan is Steele actually John quite a, significant. I thought he made a pretty powerful argument there about this life cycle of segregation. Mm. You go from the school uh, to the workplace that's segregated, you're living in a group home, and 
you, you, you're then trapped into that, that but the, cycle. But the issue is <clears throat> this whole, oh, but some, some people are really enjoying these schools. I'm, I, I'm sure they are. But the, the There's powerful... There's some very good schools, absolutely, special schools. Absolutely, and I know many, many kids in them, right? But the powerful point is the reason they are in... Often they have tried the mainstream state school down the road and it has failed them. They have not been supported mm. to learn. And so that is about the support at that school. And right now the system is failing kids with disabilities and that is a big project to fix and it's, a, yeah. it's an important thing to, to decide to fix. And that, that is going to take state governments. We know that's going to be very difficult. The, this uh, Royal Commission final report is huge. Um, JP had had uh, quite a lot of focus on First Nations in particular uh, and the even worse statistics mm. when we talk about um, violence, neglect, abuse, exploitation of people with a disability in First Nations communities as well. What do you think about the the argument about the, the best way forward here now? Yeah, look, I think overall for First Nations people is about access to services. Mm. Um, you're talking regional and remote. Those access to services are, are extreme. I think importantly, the Senator touched on a, a really good issue and it's about people with lived experience raising what is best for them to move forward for major reform in the sector, structural reform, reform across the whole sector it's important that we listen to them. I mean, in other, in other debates, we're having people saying, you don't, have, you don't need to have a voice. It's about people actually listening. Well, here is the opportunity for Australia to listen for people with lived experience with disabilities, their families, who gave harrowing evidence yeah. about abuse, about violence, about issues that all Australians hate, but yet people are raising this. We need to listen to them and we need to do it. We can't, we can't in 10 years' time look back and say we haven't implemented the vast majority of those recommendations. It's the perfect segue uh, to get to the, the, the Voice uh, campaign. Two weeks to go. Um, the, the public polls all seem to suggest the yes case is still dropping. Phil, is there any any sense of momentum shift as we head into what the no. what the Prime Minister's always said is going to be the time when people really start to tune in? Yeah, look, no. Um, I mean, so all the polls have the yes vote now at around 40 40 per cent, if you push out some of the undecideds. I, I, if you talk to the people who sort of are doing all this, this work, they, there still is a significant rump of undecideds, you know, 17, 20 per cent. I suspect a majority of them will, will probably vote yes. So I, I suspect the yes vote will tighten we'll over pick up. the last two weeks. But whether it can get across the line, I think, is going to take some sort of huge miracle. But... Um, uh, you know, there's a narrow path there, but I don't. You know, it's it's, it's, diff it's difficult, and, and everyone everyone admits that. But um, yeah, it's just it is what it is. Well, I mean, what, what, it's interesting. Yeah, sorry, think... that they were in South Australia last week. The government and they're in Tassie. They're going to be in the cabinet's going to be in Tassie mm -hmm. this week. Yeah, if they can it's swing states. If they can get New South Wales and Victoria across the line, they're the two that matter. So they're doing a lot of activity in those in two small states. states. Yeah, I, I think in terms of momentum, I think visually. There'd be some momentum with the, the massive turnout for the marches uh, a couple of weeks ago. You know, over 200,000 Australians marched. There's been a bit of a hiccup in the no campaigning over the last couple of weeks. You know, Jacinta Price's press club address where she called that colonisation was beneficial. Warren Mundine's press club address I know we're going to talk about soon. Um, Anthony Mundine challenging Thomas Mayo to a fight. Um, the march in Melbourne... That was, you know, neo-Nazis oh, yeah, turned week. up. Yeah. So there's, there's been, I think, some hiccups in the in the momentum for the no case. Whether that can pull back well, the numbers. This is whether people are listening anymore. Yeah. Too. Well, this there's is... A real, there's, sorry, there's a real fatigue out there. Is... Hugely. I've spoken, actually, in the last couple of days to a number of people on the ground on the Yes campaign just to hear like very deliberately made some calls to go, well, what, what happens when you speak to people and you're door knocking? Uh. You're right. And they say a lot of people don't know about it still, yeah. still, right? So need it explained. Yeah. And therefore, they, by the way, see that as a positive because that means you can reach them and try and convince them. But they also say when they do know, and this is not great for the Yes campaign, they, their, their views are um, some pretty, you know, based in some racist ideas. Mm. Aboriginal people get enough. We're paying too much already. Or I will be asked to pay more. Yeah. That's the big one. Yeah. I'm going to pay more tax. Yeah, all that. Or, but that it's overwhelming when people do yeah. know. Or I'm going to lose my house, right? And I, I take your point that, uh, you know, the, the electorate is fatigued by this conversation because it seems like it's been going on mm. for well, ages and we've got two years. weeks to go. But, I mean, the fatigue for First Nations people is mm. off tap. You know, the, mm. 
the request to support services is 100% oh, increased. It doesn't detract from the, from the ambition, like it's just, but it, yeah. no, I agree. JP, you mentioned uh, Warren Mundine. There were two important speeches at the Press Club uh, this week, Warren Mundine and Noel Pearson. Warren Mundine, firstly, uh, for the No campaign, he really... Um, intensified, I suppose, the, the, the fear campaign about the voice and, and the Uluru statement in particular. It's a symbolic declaration of war against modern Australia. The canvas is a glossy marketing brochure for the misappropriation of culture, a misrepresentation of history and for a radical and divisive vision of Australia. All done in the name of Indigenous Australians, but working against us. A symbolic declaration of war. That's some pretty strong rhetoric there. Very strong rhetoric. And I think, look, to analyse Warren's speech, I want to start at the very end of it. I got to ask him a question, which I really wanted him to have the opportunity to maybe correct the CPAC comedian uh, who this performed... This is the Conservative Political yep, Action yep. Congress. He made some comments about a welcome to country and said, you know, I'd like to acknowledge violent, the violent black men. Mm. Uh, my question was to Warren to actually... This is an opportunity to say he found that offensive or to apologise for that. Uh, he didn't. Um, and, in fact, he said, you know, I don't... He compared it, I think, to Dave Chappelle. He did, yeah. Yeah, which was quite extreme. And I think even Barnaby Joyce... Uh, came on our show and found it offensive and apologised for it. So, for me, that was quite telling. I think the words of, you know, this is a symbolic declaration of war is speaking to that particular voter who was fearful of the house being taken, of having to pay more, um, of all the things that they're reading on social media. It hones in on those thoughts. Um, but it's also an insult to those who went to the Uluru dialogues, you know, 1,000 people, 250 people at Uluru themselves who came up with the statement. It's not a symbolic declaration of war. You're talking about people it's who have been in... We would have heard about it by now if it was <laughs> look, an act, act... Like, why is it now a symbolic... Yeah, it's, look, it's look one, now, of those, one of those things... Just to try and exp explore, I guess, what he means mm. here, is he's suggesting that, you know, this, this whole argument from the No campaign, that the, the voice will create division, separate, separate us between Indigenous and non-Indigenous permanently in the Constitution that modern Australia is not that. Is that, is that kind of what he's trying I've to say? I've got no idea what he's saying. I, I, I don't really understand a lot it of... It was that. overreach. Yeah. There was Look, no I, doubt about it's it. It's just a sort of sea of non-secretors that they throw out all the time and... And people like us sit around and talk about yeah, it look, rather, I... rather than actually what people are going to be voting for on the day, which is an advisory committee. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's a... Uh, yeah, I, I struggle to follow that. And, and remember, I mean, Noel Pearson also gave a really significant speech this week and he talked about this being the centrist way. Now, one of the points that Warren Mundine made in his speech is that, you know, he, he and Jacinta uh, and, and the others who agree with him want to draw the line and say no to grievance, yeah? To say, mm. we're not upset anymore, essentially. We, 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 we want to move on from colonisation and grievance. But the truth is... That's not going to happen. Mm. So if Australia votes no in two weeks, which it might, mm. that doesn't end. Warren Mundine might be OK with moving on, but most, and I say that really confidently from working in this area for a long time, most Aboriginal people are not moving on. They are living the legacy of intergenerational yeah. pain and discrimination, and they're not going to move on. So this doesn't settle anything. Yeah, look, Briggs, Briggs the Indigenous hip-hop rapper, artist, actor, writer, he, he puts it quite significantly in saying that we live in no today. Today is no. Hmm. So if we vote no on October 14th, it's going to continue. Yeah. I think, you know, saying it's a symbolic declaration of war is an insult to people like Ozzy Cruz. He's a 90-year-old Aboriginal elder and pastor, Christian pastor, on the south coast of New South Wales. He's been involved in black affairs for his entire life. Saying that he is declaring war on modern Australia is an insult to him. Noel Pearson's speech you mentioned uh, for the Yes campaign, he, by contrast, said a vote for Yes is about love, not war. Uh, and he really, I thought, took on uh, what's become the central argument from the No case, which is about dividing us on race. Mm. Noel Pearson had this response. We're not a separate race, though. We're humans. It's just that we are indigenous. And you go to some parts of the world and indigenous people are blonde and blue-eyed. This is not about race. This is about us being the original peoples in the country. 
It's an important yeah. distinction. Yeah. There, but, yeah, look, and, and to that point, we are, and I won't use the word discriminate, we already differentiate on that basis. We have a minister for Aboriginal yeah. affairs. You know, we have a department for Aboriginal affairs. We don't want for the Lebanese or the Greeks. We have a yeah. race power in the Constitution. Lebanese and the Greeks. Yeah. And, 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 you know, someone from a migrant background, you know, a few generations back, the migrant ethos was they came to this country for a better life and, and by and large achieved that. That was, that's, that's the migrant way. They're, they're grateful to this country because of they came from somewhere not so great and, and, you know, educated their kids and got wealthy and had businesses and stuff. It's a completely different story for Indigenous people. They were here first and they haven't had a great run of it in the last couple of hundred years. So this sort of racial division thing, does, it is, as Noel Pearson said, they're the Indigenous people and they already get, you know, s separate recognition now within within government at a state and federal level. And this is and the other part of the... Which the Jimba Price wants to get rid of eventually, though, yeah. she I, don't, I, don't, I can't see the logic if, of the right. If, you, if, if you're worried the voice is going to divide us on race, why would you legislate a voice? Wouldn't that divide us on race? Well, it's well exactly, and that, that's, that's the other point. Yeah, if it's divisive, argument, yeah. it's divisive, whether it's in the constitution or not. But the, the, and, well, and certainly again, the liberal position, the nationals' position is perhaps a bit different. But the liberal position is to it's legislate, legislate one. So, you know. well, obviously, yeah. their argument would be the permanency, right? And and I think that is an interesting idea. One of the arguments they make that I think Noel Pearson has answered really interestingly is, if it's there to deal with closing the gap and disadvantage, it's it's almost building in the fact that disadvantage is there forever. And Noel Pearson, when I put it to him, and he was asked to think at the press club a similar question, because I find that really interesting. Mm. If we live in the utopia <laughs> where Indigenous disadvantage is, is uh, eradicated, which would be just a day of celebration, really, but if it happened, why would you need it? Well, for, for cultural authority, for heritage, yeah. for lots of... for language. Like, it would, it would be able to do all of that work, wouldn't it, yeah, JP? Yeah, just for lots of things that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been arguing and marching and debating for generations mm. that still remain, I think, the fundamental grievance of First Nations people. Yeah. Why is the yes vote still sinking? I'd look, there's myriad reasons. The, 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 efficient, the sort of ruthless efficiency of social media and the ability to spread misinformation has, has been. But I also just, just, it's just not a good time. To, the country's not feeling generous at the because moment. Because of cost of living. Yeah. People aren't feeling magnanimous at the moment. It, you know, in retrospect, you couldn't ask for worse time for people to do something like this. And there is anger with the government over cost of living and stuff like that. Whether and and. An element of the no vote is I'm angry at Albanese yeah. and I want to send him a message. We had a poll in, in the AFR start of the week and it, and it had 15% um, of people who had intended to vote yes in May had switched to no and the most commonly cited reason was they thought it, it was distracting the government from the, the cost of housing mm. and, and petrol and things. So it's it's become a proxy for, you know, a lightning rod, yeah. if you like, for political discontent. Well, perhaps uh, fearing a no outcome in a couple of weeks' time, it's interesting that the Prime Minister, a few times this week, um, perhaps laying the groundwork a, a little for a potential no result, mm. started talking about the fact this process has still been worthwhile in his view, that it's raised issues around Indigenous disadvantage. Inevitably, I will be asked wherever I travel, which we're now in October 14, uh, about Indigenous affairs. And for me, it's a positive that this referendum is raising the awareness of the Australian people about the gaps that are there between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australia. JP, would most Indigenous Australians, you think, agree that it's been a positive, that it's been worthwhile, even if it goes down? Yeah, absolutely. As I said, look, it's been the opportunity, I think, for First Nations people to, to raise the issues that they've been talking about and marching and arguing, debating for, mm. for generations. Uh, look, we just finished our, our last community show on NITV's The Point. We travelled over 36,000 kilometres there, around really Australia. <laughs> you know, talking to people about their opinions yeah. on The Voice. Our last show was up in uh, Roburn on Nalama country. Um, we did our show on the, the edge of the river, on the riverbank, the Harding River, I think it's called. But it's a stone's throw away from the Victoria Hotel, which is where in 1983, a young 16-year-old boy, Aboriginal boy, was killed in a fight with a handful of off-duty police. His name was John Pat. And from that, we got the Royal Commission in the Deaths in Custody. Yeah. The anniversary of John Pat's death was on Friday. Look, Australia's forgotten about who John Pat is. Roeburn will never forget who John mm. Pat was and is. And I think highlighting all those issues will still remain an issue long after October 14. 
And the, the final comment in our community shows was from a Nalawa woman called Samantha Walker who said, look, it might just be a crumb, but from that crumb I can make a slice of bread and from that slice of bread I can make a loaf. So from a little thing, a big thing can grow. All right, well said. Let's move on to uh, Dan Andrews. Big political news uh, this week with um, <laughs> perhaps the most prominent and dominant mm. uh, Premier. Uh, prominent, dominant. Yeah, all of that. Uh, and look, most successful three election wins. He increased his margin uh, late last year in the, in the third election win, which is um, uh, an impressive feat, but a polarising Premier too. He's called it quits. He did tell this program the morning after that third election win back in November that he'd see out the full four-year term, but I don't think anyone was no, too they shocked. Say, they all say that. <laughs> they all say that. <laughs> no one was too surprised to hear him say this during the week. You never want to finish up in a situation where you aren't enjoying the work and where you are resentful of the fact that you're doing this and not doing something else. I'm not at that point, but I'm determined never to get to that point. PK, uh, let's look at his legacy, his achievements, his failures, um, and obviously Victorians have very different views when, oh, yeah. <laughs> when it comes to this list. Uh, but what, what do you think of uh, the legacy he leaves? I think he leaves a, a, a mixed legacy. He is an election-winning machine, the one of the most skilled communicators I've seen, um, with an ability for a cut-through message that resonated with people. He understood his state. Now, he was bagged, you know, across the country, but he understood Victoria like no one I've seen. Um, he won that last election because of terrible opposition, but also because people on balance gave him credit for the work he'd done through the pandemic, even though, as I say, it was pretty divisive, some of it, and, and not everyone loved what he did during the pandemic. But on balance, Victorians... Uh, gave him credit for fronting up every single day and kind of uh, being really a, a towering figure during that time. But he leaves the state with enormous amounts of debt. For that debt, you get a pretty big infrastructure bill, though, and I think there is a sort of grudging respect for the fact that a growing state that will surpass Sydney, and we are proud of that <laughs> as Melburnians, um, does need strong infrastructure, a lot of migrants, a lot of people coming into Victoria, you need that. Well, you mentioned um, the debt. Have a look at... Uh, this is the uh, state debt as a proportion of the, of the state of the Victorian economy, and you can see it going mm. up there to, um, what is it, just uh, around the 24% mark. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I guess the question is, um, do people care as much about debt if they see all the big infrastructure being built, or is this... Bill, what do you think? Well, they do when they start whacking taxes yeah. on schools and beach houses and that's yeah. the sort of start of it, you know, and it's going to go for generations down there because this has to be paid off. And, I mean, Victoria's debt is cumulatively greater than the rest of the eastern states combined. Bigger than it's Tas mass Tasmania, New South Wales and Queensland. Queensland is massive. It's a huge problem. It, it, it's, it's, it's the worst part of Dan Andrews' legacy by miles. I mean, it's... Um, and there were, po there were other... Um, Policy failures, obviously the Commonwealth Games, yeah. you know, it was on and then it was off. Yeah, that's uh, right. Yeah, but, there was but, the red shirt scandal, there were all these things. Well, everyone has Absolutely, that, but, there was a lot. Um, and also the centralisation of power yeah. around him. He cut out that sort of accountability stuff with people like Virginia Trioli and, um, and Neil Mitchell, Mitchell and, was... and answering questions. He communicated, though, and it's troubling to us as journalists who want to ask the questions, and I'm in that category, but he communicated with voters by cutting out the media often and um he you used know, social media the in social... a way that uh, yeah they, 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 they were the first actually to tell, tell the mainstream but, we don't really know yeah. you guys but as a victorian there were other things that he did on the progressive side mm. um which i think is he, he was considered a conviction politician that you know the state of massachusetts the joke that we make of, mm. of victoria he was a really progressive premier on trans rights, LGBTIQ yeah. rights, I can't euthanasia tell you, and, euthanasia, yeah. um, uh, women's right to choose, women's health. On those sort of issues, I think that you've never seen such a progressive premier for, for, for generations. And, and that kind of matched the mood of the state, and, and that's what he'll be remembered for too, I think. Yeah, for First Nations people, I mean, he, he was instrumental in the pathway to treaty, of course, setting up a truth-telling commission, the Euro Commission, Nations Assembly. Yeah, First Nations mm -hmm. Assembly, and that continues today, and I think, uh, you know, the, the comments from the two leaders there that he, he helped advance Aboriginal affairs in Victoria uh, was a significant legacy for him. Yeah, there's this... A uh, few people have made this point that you knew what he stood for, right? And you can, Did you? Well, 
I think on the progressive issues. On some things, yeah, on those issues, on social issues, absolutely. But I found him a, to be somewhat of a conjurer. I wrote during the week, he's a bit like one of those RS Hill hypnotists, you know, look into my eyes. Yeah, he, would, <laughs> he would tell you exactly the opposite and you could believe it. Like the Com Games mm. was a classic where people were saying, don't do it, you can't do it, it's going to cost too much money. And it's like, don't back chat me, fella, I know boats. Then it goes pear-shaped. Then he comes out and does this press conference. It's all someone else's fault. And look how much I've saved you. We're only having to pay $380 million. Everyone goes, oh, you're so great. Right. He, he was yeah. just brilliant at, at you know, just reversing... At politics. Re yeah, well... <laughs> that, that's well, that's what it is. Well, that's what it is. Yeah, 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 yeah but that's what it is. Shifting the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when shifting it, but, but, but flipping it on its head. Yeah. And, 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 and sort of... Sometimes absolutely and, infuriating. And, and he did that during the start of COVID when things were going wrong with the contact tracing and stuff and it was never his fault. And, 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 and Jacinda Allen, uh, the new Premier, unsurprisingly, although there was a little bit of, uh, you know... Um, a bit of a bit of argy bargy in the caucus on the way through, but uh, I don't think uh, her becoming leader was any great surprise. What difference can we expect? More collegiate, less centralised? Oh, she's a really different type of leader, uh, just in her style alone. Um, she's in the same faction. She was certainly, you know, supported to, into this role by Dan Andrews, so she's closely aligned. So, in terms of the agenda. It's very similar. She also presided over a lot of the uh, blowouts in the infrastructure too. Yeah. So and, she, and the she carries that. Too, her, she uh, carries all of that yeah. too. So it's not going to be it's not going to be easy for her. But she's got over three years, mm. right? Yeah. Like there's fixed terms in Victoria, yeah. and an they're only ten months an increased in. Increased margin, something like that. But you can see when to... when the premier when Mr Andrews quit, and he had the the, the fix was in for Jacinda Allen to get that job, and the right yeah. said, you know, they didn't have the numbers. They, they, they challenged to force their way into the deputy position. So I think that iron-gloved iron discipline of which he ruled the party, mm -hmm. you know, the, it, was, it was sort of autocratic style, that's going to be a big change. I don't think uh, the new Premier is going to have anywhere near that authority. Now, uh, another major departure this week, although not permanent at this stage, is Mike Pizzullo, the Home Affairs oh, Secretary. <laughs> now, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. the nine newspapers in 60 Minutes revealed a stack of uh, messages, private messages, between Mike Pizzullo and Scott Briggs, who's a, a Liberal Party uh, operative, uh, I guess is the word, close to both Scott Morrison as Prime Minister and Malcolm Turnbull as Prime Minister. Now, these messages... Mike Bazzullo is uh, offering his views, often critical views of some ministers, some in the media, uh, suggesting who uh, should be a right winger, should be put into the Home Affairs Ministry. The question here is whether this is something an apolitical public service chief should be doing at all, their private communications. Mm. Phil, this is now the sub he's, he stood aside. This is, this is now the subject of inquiry by the Public Service Commission. What do you think? Did he overstep the mark? Well, they are private conversations. I mean, <laughs> that's the point. Um, so it's hard to, if you said this stuff publicly, then most definitely. But um, I guess you know he's, he's been he's been pinged by by someone putting out these um these these encrypted messages, these WhatsApp messages. So it does prima facie establish the case that he has overstepped the mark. People who know Mike Puzzle they aren't sort of surprised because that's that's how he rolls. He's been an empire builder and mm. you know, likes, likes to roll his sleeves up and sort of. Try and, you we know, probably yeah, explain, yeah, to, yeah. explain to people who may not know who Mike he, Pizzolo is and why he's a bit unique when it comes to department secretary. He's a complete Canberra. savant for national security. He, 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 just talking about polarising figures, he, he started life you know, as a staffer for, for, for Labor. Yeah. Gareth Evans, I think it was the ashtray of the stapler that Gareth, Gareth Evans threw in a fit of rage <laughs> that hit Pizzolo on the head, I think. That's the urban legend. But He was then Beasley's deputy Beasley, chief Beasley's staffer. staffer. Um, he wrote the white paper for... Yeah, he's always had this defence foreign thing, but his idea was always home affairs. He had this big, you know, super secure portfolio and mm -hmm. he drove that. He's annoyed a lot of people on the way. Usually attorneys general, like George Brandis, doesn't like him. The current attorney general doesn't like him. He took things like federal police and ASIO and put but them the into the super hawkish department. the national security minister. Yeah. Yeah, very, hawkish, very hawkish, very hawkish, um, very... Um, but he's also a, a stickler, ironically, mm -hmm. for um, where the line normally is with the public service. Well, I mean, for example, the day Scott Morrison called the election and wanted... Uh, wanted to amplify the arrival of a boat. Uh, Mike Pizzullo he, said no, wouldn't let that happen. He threw Morrison under the yeah, bus. But these right. messages, PK, um, what do you think? Do they suggest that he's... Well, you say he's a stickler on that day. I don't know. He seems to me like... Uh, from that he's just very good at reading politics and he knew there was about to be a change of government. Sorry, but that's how it looks to me. Look into um, my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very look into my eyes. Um, look... These messages, as you say, prima facie, absolutely establish that this is not appropriate for a public servant. He is trying to influence a political 
player in the Liberal Party, right? Not an official that he's accountable to. He's trying to avoid um, FOIs or any ability to, for anyone to have any accountability of being able to look at what he's sending and doing, which public service, you know, is meant to be accountable. He's skirting the system um, badly, clearly, uh, and trying to influence someone to get right-wingers into his portfolio. The whole thing stinks. It's not appropriate and you don't want... Sure, public servants um, should provide frank and fearless advice about things that they think, but through the proper channels... Yeah. There's also um, the question here it's, of... Um, it's wrong. The, the danger, I suppose, of putting anything like this in writing hmm. and the damage that all of this now causes... To, I mean, obviously, they didn't intend for all of this to be made public, but the damage that causes for... You know the standing of the public service and public service chiefs yeah. here as well. It's it's crazy. I think you know that that when I read it, I'm going, how do they get access to those messages? And someone well, that's a very good question. Is, well, the reporters is, is they were lawfully obtained. Yeah, so yeah. But you, you, I don't but know what that means. two issues. You know, the public service is meant to be apolitical. Canberra is a public service town or majority public service. You know, what does it say to those acting EL ones or ASO sixes? Can you can you say these things now because the secretary of the department? is saying it. So it blurs the line, I think, for a lot of people about the public service still being apolitical. The other thing is a lot of politicians and public servants use those secure messaging apps. And what does it say about the security of those, that they can be yeah. handed and over? He's one of our top yeah. ranking security officials. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I guess just imagine. I'd like to yeah, imagine if we were privy to all the private conversations by our departmental secretaries. Oh, to, to this guy's <laughs> just been. Yeah, this yeah, has yeah, just yeah, been yeah, yeah. obtained, right? Yeah. Yes, you're right. And the yeah. first thing he was, there's a communication with a fellow called Scott Briggs, who, for the listeners, is a sort of well-known lobbyist around here and was very close to Scott Morrison and Malcolm yeah. Turnbull. But Pozzolo was very, very close to Scott Morrison. They stopped the boats together. That's that was his ascension. That was his hmm. big, big, big sort of you know, rise to power. And so he could sort of pick up the phone to Morrison any time too. So I'm I'm sort of curious as to why he needed why, was, Were those two just cracking hardy or was it really trying to I influence the PM? I don't know. And this is what the... We'll see where the uh, inquiry lands. I wouldn't expect it should take too long once they have a good look at the uh, the, the message. Uh, yeah, he obvi so. I don't see how he can... He's cooked. He's, he's he can't... Cooked. Word is no, he's cooked. The, the PM doesn't well, want him well, back and right. the Minister doesn't want I him back. I think it's it's him or Eddie Jones, whoever goes first. <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's the question <laughs> Australia's asking. It's not Eddie Jones. All right. <laughs> Our panel, uh, John Paul Janke, Patricia Garvelis and Phil Curry will be back very shortly with some final observations. Time now for Mike Bowers and Talking Pictures. I'm Mike Bowers and I'm photographer at large for The Guardian Australia. I'm talking pictures this morning with artists and cartoonists for the Saturday paper, the one and only John Kadelka, and a very warm Tasmanian welcome. A lovely, toasty, warm Tasmanian welcome to you. Apparently Tasmania's awful, mate. Yep, never come here. Never come here. So of course, by the time you've seen the T-shirt, it's <laughs> too late. Too late. John, most politicians uh, leave politics to spend more time with their family, but it seems that Dan Andrews wants to spend less time on the job. He's well, had enough. Fair enough. I mean, nine years of Premier, it's probably time to go and do something else. Uh, lovely David Rowe, Dan Andrews, my way. Let the record show I took the blows and did it my way. Is uh, regrets. I've had a few, but too few to mention. Oh, look, if you've, you've been nine years and, as a politician don't have a few regrets, and you haven't really been doing your job. Well, that's right. Quite frankly, if you're, if you're leaving the room and everyone's screaming at you, then you've probably done your job pretty well. There's a, there's a lot to pack in here. He's got on the beers, he's having a cheeky smoke, his golf clubs are there, and Ibeck is humping his leg. Yep, yep. Um, we've got the, the red shirt down there. Yep. The, the, the stairs is about to probably fall off again, and... Uh, He's got the neck brace neck ready, though. Yep. The, the, the tunnel there. The yeah, tunnel it's, hat. It's fully Dan. Brett Lethbridge seems to think there's some lessons here for the uh, Queensland leadership. As Steve Miles here, Stephen Miles is saying to Anastasia Palaszczuk, look, it's time for yeah. you to go too. She's been around a while, hasn't yeah, she? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Stephen, I haven't seen today's headlines. Why do you ask? <laughs> look, uh, yeah, I reckon uh, three terms is about right. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, He's got the stare that, that, that he gives... Quite well, I thought. Terrifying laser yeah. beams. Yeah. <laughs> John, public servants are supposed to give uh, frank and fearless advice, just not on Liberal Party strategy. Mike Pazullo seems to have crossed a line here of some form or other. Yeah, he does seem to have snuck across the border just quietly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kathy Wilcox has got a bit of a puppet show going on <laughs> at arm's length. What's that, Mr Briggs? You think we need a bigger and more powerful Department of Home Affairs? Yes, Mr. Prime Minister, and I know just the public servant to run it. I'm sure he would have done the voices. I mean, if you're going to do the evil puppets, you do the evil voices. Yeah. I, mean, I would. 
if I were to be a uh, head of a public service, I'm sure I would be great at. I love this David Pope's drawing on the Wizard of Oz. Who dares question the fearless and impartial Bazulo of Oz? We're off to see the wizard. Yeah, quite. <laughs> a really, really nice depiction here. Insert image of new minister here. <laughs> no, not that one. No, not yeah, that one. Exactly. <laughs> no, 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 not that one. <laughs> Lifting the curtain here on Canberra. It's a menacing image from Glenn Lelivre. Yeah, the whole kind of uh, man behind the curtain thing. It, I mean, I'm sure they're all doing it in the public service. Yeah. But I, mean, I don't to... think Pizzullo has ever hidden behind a curtain in no, his life. No, exactly. He's... You've got him uh, um, on water matters here. Yeah, exactly. I just, I did. There is a border, a line you're not meant to cross. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, he did it without shame. A humble public servant flees an oppressive regime. <laughs> you know, the man, the man wants to be free. I can understand that. John, did you see the images in the Australian Financial Review magazine's um, Power Issue? Uh, they not only sent out their photographer, James Brickwood, to do some pretty good portraits, but they uh, used AI to generate some pretty sort of, some of them are a little bit creepy, I've got to say, yeah. images. Well, that's the problem is that the AI is getting just good enough. You know, you get that, like animators talk about, you get too close to the reality and... Uh, and it doesn't look real. Yeah, it looks like, it's like um, when cartoonists, the, the more broadly you draw, the more you can say because you, people aren't confusing it with reality, if you know what I mean. Well, I just, I just don't understand why if you're a newspaper trying to build an image of trust, trustworthiness and truthfulness, you would muddy the waters by generating a whole heap of, of AI images, which basically use all sorts of images from the internet. So it's, a, it's, it's actually copyright theft. I mean, is this even real? Are we even here? Is this the ABC just saving it? You know? this, is, this is all AI generated. Exactly. So, and, and so is David back in the studio. I'll let you throw back to him. <laughs> uh, back to you, Spearsy. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you, Mike. I'm pretty sure we're real. Uh, <laughs> we are real, aren't we? So yeah. Let's get yeah. some uh, final observations, JP. Uh, we're at that stage of a national debate, national conversation, where Clive Palmer enters the debate, um, of course, talking about The Voice and the reported $2 million spend on advertising as we head to referendum day. Um, I think for a lot of Indigenous Australians, Clive Palmer is like that eighth player on a football field that enters the melee on the football field when it's almost finished. He's only doing it for his Instagram reel. You think? Yeah. PK. Uh, the ACCC has released a childcare report showing that families are paying one-sixth of their income a year on childcare. One of the highest um, levels of childcare fees families are paying in the OECD. It's out of control. Yeah. And suggest things like potentially price caps. Watch this space because we are paying far too much if we want to get particularly women in the workforce and it's a massive problem for productivity and also for kids. Just quick one, Bobby Hill. Mm. <laughs> Magpies. <laughs> we had to get it in, didn't we? We had to get Norm it in. Norm yes, Smith, yes. medalist, oh, survived testicular cancer yeah. last year and was just sensational. I am just, so all I do is retweet pictures of him. I love him so much. That's just my observation. <laughs> no, I've got nothing else to it's say. Fair enough. We'll still leave plenty for offsiders to, to get into. Uh, look, twice this week, the Prime Minister went out of his way to condemn the attack on the NT Chief Minister Natasha Files. It's not funny. It's not, not even remotely funny. And it's getting quite serious. The, the security threats to MPs now. We saw a kid walk up to Scott Morrison in the last campaign and you know, try and hit him in the head with an egg. I know the temptation is to laugh at this, but you know, these could be people with guns or knives. The, the, the security threats now to politicians is completely unprecedented. I know a senator who has had to move out of her house. I know an MP who can't go to his electorate office. The federal police are getting really worried about this. So good on the Prime Minister for calling out, and I think the rest of us need to do it more too. It's not, it's not acceptable at all in no, any, well any way, shape uh, or form. Absolutely agree. Yeah. Well said. All right, thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Thanks for your company too. That's it for the program this week. We will be back next week, one week out from the voice referendum, and we'll be joined by Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. Hope to see you then.